Hello, everyone, and welcome to My Vote Counts, a weekly webinar uh, hosted by the Michigan Department of State, where you get to learn about all things Michigan elections. Our session today will be discussing voting at your polling place. Many of you submitted questions for our staff to answer live during our presentation today, and we'll be answering several of those questions throughout today's presentation. And we'll also be taking additional questions at the end of today's presentation. Uh, at last week's session, um, we noticed a high increase in the number of questions we were getting, which is really great. We're so glad you all are here and asking questions. Um, that may mean we might not get to your question live during today's event, uh, but we'll be sure and provide you all the information information and answers you need um, in our follow-up email after the session concludes. Before we get started talking about voting at your polling place, there are a few dates we'd like to go over with you. All right, the statewide primary election is coming up. It is Tuesday, August 2nd, and polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. The statewide general election will be on Tuesday, November 8th, with polls open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. The statewide primary election, as I stated, is Tuesday, August 2nd, and it's the last day you can register, or the last day that you can register to vote online was actually yesterday, July 18th. Um, that was also the recommended date to request an absentee ballot and return it by mail. That was July 18th yesterday, and that's our recommended date so we can ensure the absentee ballot arrives through the mail on time. You can vote early in person with an absentee ballot at your city or township clerk's office through 4 p.m. Monday, August 1st. You should return your signed absentee ballot by hand to a drop box or to your local clerk's office by 8 p.m. on election day. And you can register to vote in person at your city or township clerk's office by 8 p.m. on election day. Be sure to visit michigan.gov vote. It's your one-stop shop for all of your elections information. You can register to vote, update your registration, view a sample ballot and more. And again, that's michigan.gov forward slash vote. By visiting that website, you can do all of these things listed here, including viewing a sample ballot, finding your local clerk's office or your polling place information, which we will talk about a lot more in today's presentation. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Megan Shar. Megan, over to you. Thanks, Sarah. So like Sarah mentioned, we are discussing everything about voting at your polling place on election day today. Polling places are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. on election day. So you may be asking, what is a polling place? Well, a polling place is the location where voting actually takes place during the election. Election inspectors running the polling places are available on site to assist voters with the process. These may be located in a school, a church, a government building, or a community center. And you can go to michigan.gov slash vote to find your designated polling location. Before visiting your polling location. Sorry, Megan, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> um, we did have a question submitted um, before today's presentation that I'd, I'd like to pose to you. Um, can anyone go, can, can someone go to any polling place to cast a, a vote? So the answer to this is no, you must go to the precinct that you're assigned in order to cast your vote. You can look all of this information up on the michigan.gov slash vote website. You'll put in your, your information and it will tell you where your designated polling location is. So you need to go to that specific location only. Great, thanks Megan. So before visiting your polling place, there's a few things that you should keep in mind. One, you should remember that there are options with how you can vote. So you can either go in person on election day or ahead of time, you can request an absentee ballot and vote um, without having to be in person waiting in line on election day. You, could, you should also check your registration status. Make sure that you are registered and that it has your current address. You can do this online or by visiting your local clerk's office. If you're not yet registered, 
make sure to visit your local clerk's office by 8 p.m. on election day to register to vote. Um, you should double check the location of your polling place. You wanna make sure that it, you know where you're going, make sure that there haven't been any changes to that since you last voted. And online, you can also preview your ballot. So it will be a sample ballot available on michigan.gov slash vote. And that will have all of the items that will appear on your ballot on election day. This is all great. Thanks, Megan. Um, I do have a couple other questions that were submitted before today's session for you. Um, this isn't a question so much as it is a request. Uh, can the Michigan Department of State please post all candidates Democrats, Republicans, and others, um, all of the candidates' information, like what are they running for, what are their party affiliations and their biographies, et cetera. So like I said, you can view your sample ballot online at michigan.gov slash vote. However, the Department of State does not provide any additional biographical or background information on the candidates running for office. For that information, you would need to turn to an outside source, um, like a nonpartisan voter guide, um, such as Voter 411. Great. One more question for you. Someone asked, my district changed this year. Why did it change? And will this impact my polling location? So due to the recent redistricting, voters may have been assigned to a new district. Again, that's why it's important that you log on to that michigan.gov slash vote website to verify and find your polling place for this year because there could have been changes since 2020. So voting at your polling place. Like I said earlier, polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Um, when you go to your polling place, you need to remember to bring an acceptable form of voter ID um, a photo ID, such as a driver's license, state ID, school ID, passport, or other photo ID. You're going to look for signage for the location and entrance. And then once inside, you can locate an election inspector at the check-in table. They're going to be able to assist you through the voting process, especially if you're a first-time voter. Find one of those election inspectors. They can answer your questions and walk you through the process. And most importantly, stay in line. Registered voters who are in line by 8 p.m. on election day are still permitted to vote. So if it's 8 p.m. and the polling place is closing and there's a long line, stay in line because you will be able to vote and they will work through all the voters in line before closing the precinct. All right, another question for you. I visited my polling place in 2020, and there was a sign on the door that said my polling place had changed at the last minute to a new location. Why does this happen? So in 2020, the situation was a little bit different. Many polling places were moved to new locations to minimize crowding and maximize the ability of election workers and voters to social distance because we were in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Each city or township sets the location of their own polling places. So again, find the address for your precinct at michigan.gov slash vote. But hopefully there won't be too much of a need for moving precincts um, the day of the election. That's good to know, thanks. So what does voting look like when you arrive at your polling place? Like I said, you're going to sign in. Um, well, first, you're gonna approach your polling place and likely have to wait in a line as there will be other voters voting in person as well. And then once you are into the polling place, you're going to sign in and have your photo ID checked by an election inspector. If you forgot your photo ID or you don't have an acceptable photo ID, then you will be issued an affidavit for verifying your identity. Um, after that is completed, you'll be issued a ballot. You'll take your ballot to one of the booths. You'll fill out the ballot and then you will receive a secrecy sleeve. So you'll put your ballot in that sleeve and walk it over to the tabulator and insert it in the tabulator at that point to have your vote counted. It's important to keep in mind as well that 
um, elections in Michigan are decentralized. So the election clerks administer all of these elections and have the ability to run their precincts. Great. So another question for you, um, this was submitted before today's event. Can voting machines in polling places or clerk's offices be manipulated by outside or foreign entities? So each piece of voting equipment is put through logic and accuracy testing prior to the election to make sure ballots will be counted correctly. While election materials are in use, they're closely, closely watched by those election inspectors and those election inspectors are trained to notice any suspicious behavior. Um, jurisdictions also have adopted policies that forbid the voting machines from being connected to the internet during the election day. After the 2020 election, it was reviewed and analyzed that that election was actually one of the most secure and accurate elections that the state has ever held. If you have more questions about election security and how we protect our democracy, um, you can visit michigan.gov SOS and then just search election security and there's more resources available on the website. Great. So who may be in your polling place? Aside from voters, there are other key players in your polling place on election day. Election inspectors are paid and trained government workers, sometimes called poll workers, and they are helping to assist voters in process ballots. Michigan has 83 counties, 280 cities, and 1,240 townships. So each of these units of government require a staff of paid workers to help voters and help process ballots. At each precinct, there is a chairperson who's the lead um, election inspector managing the polling place, and they're also ma managing those other election workers. And then you also have your local clerk, who's the local government official in charge of running elections in your city or township. All election inspectors and chairpersons report to the local clerk. Great. We have a couple questions about serving as an election inspector that were submitted prior to today's event. The first question is, how can I sign up to be a poll worker? And can I sign up as a group? And that's a great question. I'm happy to take that one. Um, anyone, any registered voter in Michigan um, can sign up to serve as an election inspector, sometimes called poll workers. Uh, in Michigan. You can sign up a couple different ways. Uh, the state has a sign up form that you can access at michigan.gov forward slash democracy MVP. That's MVP as in most valuable player. Um, you can complete the election worker interest form at that website and your information will be provided to local clerks across the state uh, who may need additional assistance running their local elections. Um, one thing that's important to note is that serving as an election inspector or a chairperson is not a volunteer position. It is a paid and hired position. You will receive training and you will work on election day and you will be compensated for your work. Um, another way that you can apply is by contacting a local clerk and asking for an application. Um, and something important to note about that is that you do not have to only apply in your local jurisdiction or with your designated clerk's office. You can apply with any clerk's office across the state. Another question is, what is the pay for poll workers and how many hours do they have to work? That's a great question. Um, Megan mentioned a little bit uh, on the last slide how Michigan's elections are quite decentralized. Um, and the same thing applies here. Each clerk hires their own poll workers or election inspectors. They set their own rate of pay and many of them assign shifts or expect that their election inspectors will work the full election day from before poll open at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. until poll close at 8 p.m. Um, so if you have questions about rate of pay, if you have questions about scheduling your application status or how many hours you might have to work, you should contact a local clerk's office where you intend to apply to ask those questions. All right, Megan, back to you. 
So there are some other key players that may be in your polling place on election day. Some of those are election challengers and a challenger is a non-governmental volunteer who is observing um, the election. They're typically appointed by a political party or an interest group to observe elections. These individuals must have displayed credentials on at all times, and they are there for the purposes of making challenges to either a voter's eligibility or a voting process to keep elections um, secure and running smoothly. Additionally, there are poll watchers, and these are non-governmental volunteer observers without credentials. So poll watchers have much more limited rights than a challenger, and they may not issue challenges while in the polling place. Um, both poll watchers and poll challengers are unable to assist voters at a polling place. Um, and the Department of State and local clerks do not hire these individuals, rather they are volunteers. Thanks, Megan. We have one question about this. Can we sign up with MDOS or Democracy MVP to be a poll watcher? So neither the Department of State or Democracy VMP, Democracy MVP hire poll watchers or election challengers. Um, they're completely volunteers and they are typically organized through political parties or other interested organizations. So election challenges. Election challengers can issue challenges on election day. There are three types of challenges that can um, be issued. One, a, voter, a challenge to a voter's eligibility to cast a ballot and the reasons that are permissible for this type of challenge include if the person is less than 18 years of age, the person is not a United States citizen, um, the person has not lived in the city or township where they are attempting to vote for 30 days or more prior to the election, and the person is not a registered voter. So those are the permissible reasons to make a challenge to a voter's eligibility. Um, they can also challenge processes that the election inspector follows, and they can challenge if an absent voter is voting at the polls. So any challenges must be made with a good reason to suspect a violation of election law has occurred. Challengers cannot just pick out anyone in line and attempt to challenge their eligibility. They cannot make a challenge for the purpose of delaying the voting process, and they cannot discriminate on race or appearance of a voter or because of a voter's political affiliation. If your eligibility is challenged on election day, there's no need to worry. Um, the Megan, are you with us? Uh oh, it looks like we may have lost Megan. We might just uh, give her another few moments to see if she's able to rejoin us. While we're waiting on Megan, we can go ahead and proceed to the next slide and we'll return to information about election challengers when she hops back on. All right, polling place do's and don'ts. Do bring a voter information guide or pamphlet with you to vote. Just be sure to use it discreetly while you're casting a ballot and to take it with you when you leave. Do bring an interpreter with you if you need assistance voting in your preferred language, and we'll go through that a little bit more in just a few moments. Do take a selfie outside the voting area. 
do not wear campaign clothes or accessories like a sticker or hat or a pin um, into or within 100 feet of a polling place. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Do not bring election or campaign flyers into or within 100 feet of a polling place. And do not take a photo within the voting area. And here we have Keila Crane with the Michigan Department of State with us. Um, Keila, we have a few questions about um, what you can and can't do in a polling place. Um, the first question that we have here, my organization likes to buy food and drinks for people standing in line. Can we still do that this year? That's a great question that we've received uh, frequently here at the Department of State. So. The short answer is yes, you can provide uh, food and drink. We do not have the same law that you may have seen in other states, um, but you just provide it to anyone. So anybody that walks up to the polling location area, if you're providing pizza or coffee or drinks, you're able to provide that to anyone. So yes, you may still be able to do that. Great. And the next question that we have is, can people with a license to carry a concealed weapon bring it into a polling place? So as um, Sarah and Megan stated earlier, um, many of our polling locations are in schools or in churches, um, and many of those um, have an exception uh, to the concealed uh, pistol uh, license holder. So you will not be able to bring those into um, you may not be able to bring those types of weapons into the school um, or house of worship area. So you um, may need to look to see where your polling location is to determine whether or not you're able to bring those types of items into, um, into that location. Great. And, um, you know, it's generally understood, too, that private property owners have the right to exclude possession of firearms in buildings they own or control, and in which polling place, places or other election-related activities may be held on election day, like we talked about in one of the first slides, um, which yeah. went over where a polling place may be. And I see Megan has hopped back on and is able to, to rejoin our conversation. Megan, glad to have you back. We just went over this polling place do's and don'ts slide. And the next slide that we are on is electioneering laws. So I will hand it back to you. And thank you to Keila Crane there for answering those questions as well. Thank you. And I apologize, we lost um, our network for a little bit. So I think we are back up and running. So there are election electioneering laws in Michigan. So what this means is that within a hundred feet of a polling place, candidates cannot campaign um, or place any type of campaign related materials. This includes both materials for a candidate or for a ballot measure. So occasionally there are additional ballot measures that are on your ballot to vote on. Those cannot be um, advertised or displayed within 100 feet of the polling place either. So this includes wearing or bringing election or campaign related um, clothing or accessories into the polling place, displaying or wearing any signage or bringing in campaign or partisan materials. Um, additionally, you can't request signatures or um, signing petitions outside of the polling place as well. I got another question for you, Megan. All right. What should someone do if they see campaigning close to a polling place? So initially, you should alert the election inspectors. They are the ones that are running this polling place. So um, the election inspectors can either direct someone to cover up campaign materials on clothing or buttons or ask that um, materials be removed from the polling place. Um, if there are ongoing violations, they can also reach out to law enforcement if necessary, but your first step would be to alert the election inspector about what is going on and what you've identified. Great. So, 
before going to vote, it's so important to know all of your rights. And one of those is that you have the right not to be turned away. Um, you are entitled to have your voice heard. So it's important to remember to bring your photo ID to the polling place. If you do not have your photo ID, like we mentioned earlier, you are still going to be able to vote, but you will have to sign an affidavit verifying your identity with the election inspector prior to being issued your ballot. This affidavit can be used by individuals who don't have an acceptable photo ID, or you have the photo ID, but you forgot to bring it with you on election day. Once you sign the photo ID, you're gonna be able to cast your ballot and it will be counted along with all the others on election day. Voter ID requirements. So what types of IDs are acceptable? That would be your Michigan driver's license or state issued ID card, um, a driver's license or ID card issued by another state, federal or state government issued photo ID, so a passport or other government issued photo ID, a military ID with photo, a student ID with photo from a high school or an accredited institution of higher learning like a college or a tribal identification card that has your photo. This photo ID does not have to have your address on it and it's acceptable for your name to be either a shorter or longer name than is included on your voter registration. So if you completed your voter registration under the name Bill, but your driver's license is in the name William, that will be accepted. Another question for you. What if my photo ID looks a lot different than how I look now? If your photo ID looks different than you look now, um, the clerk who is verifying your ID will ask for a second form of ID. So if you present an identification that doesn't resemble you closely enough for the clerk to verify your identity, they will ask for a second form of picture ID. If um, you either don't have a second form or you refer refuse to give the clerk an additional form of ID and your voter identity cannot be resolved with um, the second picture or you do not have one, you'll be issued a provisional envelope ballot at that point. So this goes into the affidavit of voter not in possession of picture ID. So you can sign this if, again, you have a photo ID that you possess, but you don't have it with you at the polling place on election day or if you don't possess any acceptable form of photo ID. A voter, who, a voter who does not possess an ID or refuses to sign this affidavit cannot vote and will be referred to the local clerk to resolve the issue. A voter who claims they have an ID but refuses to show it cannot be issued a ballot either until they show their ID or Again, they will be referred to the local clerk to try and resolve the issue. A provisional ballot is a ballot requiring additional steps or information before it can be counted. So you may receive a provisional ballot if your name does not appear on the list at the polling place, you are at the wrong polling location, you are voting for the first time, and you're unable to provide a valid form of identification, or like we just covered, if your photo ID does not closely resemble what you look like today, then you may also be issued a provisional ballot. A provisional ballot can either be accepted or rejected. If election officials can verify that you are registered to vote in the appropriate jurisdiction, your provisional ballot will count. A provisional ballot will be rejected if you are not registered to vote or failed to provide proper identification um, or proof of residency. 
you have until six days after the election to provide appropriate ID documentation to your city or township clerk. Voter accessibility. So there's a lot that Michigan voters have a right to as far as accessibility in the polling place. Voting at the polls can present a unique set of challenges um, to people with disabilities, but federal and state law requires that um, polling places provide a accessible polling location. And that includes removing barriers that prevent voters from disability, um, pre preventing voters with disabilities from casting their ballot. So this includes voter assist terminals, and that would provide assistance in casting a ballot. We're going to go into that a little bit more on the next slide. But also, you're able to vote independently and privately, and this could be with or without assistance. If you require assistance in casting a ballot, you can receive assistance from another person, provided that the person assisting you is not your employer or an agent of your employer or an officer or agent um, for a union that you belong to. So if you go with a family member and you need assistance casting your ballot, the family member is able to assist you in doing so. You can also request curbside voting if necessary. If there is a barrier for you physically entering the building or you're feeling unwell or whatever reason, you can request um, curbside voting, which is a process where an election inspector brings the ballot to a person in their car outside of the polling place um, in, to enable them to vote. And then inside the polling place, there are voter assist terminals. So a voter assist terminal helps you mark your ballot using a touch screen or controller with buttons or personal adaptive devices. The device will mark the ballot and print the ballot with your selection. The complete ballot is then fed into a tabulator just as everyone else's and it scans and records your vote. Voting systems can vary from county to county and like we've said multiple times, Michigan's elections are decentralized. So if you want to learn about what device is used in your county, visit that michigan.gov slash vote and select accessible voting. Oh, so here is the information about curbside voting. I apologize. But if you need curbside voting, you can send someone into the polling place to request this on your behalf. So if you appear at the polling place with a family member, that family member could go in and alert the election official that you need curbside voting and the election official will bring the ballot outside so that you can vote. Additionally, this is the information about if you need to bring a person to assist you with voting. Again, it cannot be your employer or an agent of your employer. And it's important to note that this person cannot attempt to influence your vote. That would be a violation of uh, Michigan election laws, and that is a crime. Language access. So there are cities and townships that are required to provide ballots in non-English languages. Plied Township, Covert Township, and Fenville City are all required by law to provide a Spanish ballot. And the city of Hamtramck is required to provide a Bengali um, ballot. There are additional cities or jurisdictions that are permitted to translate in other in languages other than English. And I should clarify that all jurisdictions are permitted to translate. In, the election this year, we're aware that the city of Dearborn and Hamtramck will also be electing to provide Arabic ballots for their um, voters this year. Election day interpretation and translation. Michigan voters have a right to bring a non-English interpreter with them to the polls for assistance in casting their ballot. 
again, just like anyone assisting you with casting your ballot on election day, this person is prohibited from attempting to influence your vote in any way. And again, they cannot be an employer or agent of your employer or an officer or agent of a labor union. Voter intimidation. So voter intimidation is prohibited. So people who aren't poll workers asking for personal documentation, photographing or videotaping voters, disseminating false and misleading election information, blocking the entrance to the polling place or directly questioning voters is prohibited and it is a crime in Michigan. I have a question for you on this, Megan. What safety measures are there at the polls against agitators? So clerks are advised to contact local law enforcement prior to election day to establish points of contact in the event that assistance is required in addressing any of the scenarios described above. So if there are threats or disorderly individuals, the clerk should have a point of contact with local law enforcement to assist with the situation. Great, thank you. So what do you do if you see voter intimidation? First, you should report it. Again, who are you going to report it to? Your local election workers or the local clerk, depending on where you're seeing this happen. Law enforcement should be contacted if you're concerned about um, intimidation or people preventing others from freely participating in the election. Also, law enforcement is able to come and just observe polling locations and ensure that everything is proceeding orderly and the election is free. There are some voter protection hotlines listed on this slide. Um, so those are important numbers to note. Great, thank you, Megan. So I'm gonna pause on this slide for a moment. Um, the next segment that we have is our Q&A. And we do have um, some additional questions that were submitted prior to today's um, event. But I just wanna pause on this page in case anyone wants to quickly write down any of the voter protection hotline numbers. So I'll linger here for a few more moments while we answer a couple of questions. So again, um, questions were submitted prior to today's event. You could submit one when signing up. Um, you can also submit a question right now if you have one by clicking the Q&A button in Zoom and typing in your question. Uh, we do get a lot of questions, so we might not be able to answer every question, but we will provide additional information after today's event when we circulate the recording of today's session. So I will ask the first question we have on our list here, and that is, Approximately how many primary ballots are spoiled each election by voters inadvertently voting across Democrat and Republican candidates? So the department does not keep track of or record a reason that ballots are spoiled, but I would assume that this number would be low for the reason that you explained that there was cross voting. And for in-person ballots where someone votes across parties in a primary, the tabulator would reject that ballot. And so an election inspector would be able to assist you in spoiling that ballot. You would be able to receive a new ballot and with the clarification that you can only vote for one party in the primary. So that's why I would expect that number to be very low. If for some reason you voted absentee ballot, that absentee ballot cannot be counted if you voted across party lines. Um, so if you identify that issue ahead of time, you can contact your local clerk about spoiling your ballot so that you can receive a new ballot um, prior to election day. Great. So just to reiterate, um, and we do get this question a lot because primaries are a little unique in how you um, cast a ballot as opposed to a general election. Um, so you can either vote uh, casting a Democratic ballot or a Republican ballot or an additional party 
if there is an additional party available for your ballot. Um, can you describe how that process works a little bit, Megan? Can you clarify what your question was? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, just explain a little bit how the primary voting works, how you would request a specific party's ballot and, and not being able to to vote for two different parties. Well, so if the primary contains a presidential primary, then there are separate ballots for Democrat or Republican. Uh -huh. But if it's a non-presidential primary, it is all on one ballot okay. and you cannot vote across party lines. So I hope that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, that's great. So if you wanted to vote in for the Democratic primary, you would only wanna stay within that Democratic candidate area. That's correct. Great. All right, next question. If I received a ballot because I asked to vote absentee and I decided to walk to a polling place, what is the best thing to do with that ballot and should I bring it with me? So if you have the ballot and you have not filled it out, you should bring it with you. So if you've changed your mind about voting absentee and decide you wanna vote in person instead, you will have to spoil your ballot. The easiest way to do this is to bring the blank ballot with you on election day to your polling place, hand it over to the election inspector and indicate that you want to vote in person instead. If for some reason you have already submitted an absentee ballot, there are additional steps that may need to be taken to spoil your ballot. So make sure to reach out to your local clerk. Great. Next question. I'll be a first time voter in 2022. Congratulations to that person. What do I need to bring with me when I go vote and how can I find my polling place? It looks like Megan's screen may have frozen again, but I'm happy to answer that question for this first time voter who submitted the question. Um, you need to remember to bring an acceptable form of photo identification to the polls on election day. Uh, we walked through that earlier in today's presentation. If you don't have a photo ID, you can still vote uh, by signing that affidavit that we referenced earlier as well. Your photo ID does not need to have your address on it. And in addition, if your photo ID lists your name as a shortened form of your name, um, like Kate, Kate for Catherine, for example, um, that's fine. And after showing your photo ID to the poll worker and signing the application, you can cast your ballot. All right, next question that we got was, if I register to vote on election day, can I vote at my polling place? And the answer to that is yes, but there are a few things you might wanna consider. You have the right to register to vote and vote up to 8 p.m. on election day because Michigan is a same day voter registration state. To register or update your voter registration for the upcoming election, you have to go to your city or township clerk's office as soon as possible, but no later than 8 p.m. on election day. And if you are eligible to register to vote, uh, you will be registered by the clerk and you'll be issued a receipt. You can take that receipt to your polling place and you'll be able to present it to the poll worker um, and you will be able to cast a ballot. But one thing you might wanna consider before doing that um, is if you have enough time to make it to your polling place to cast a ballot. Remember, you have to be in line at your polling place no later than 8 p.m. on election day. So if it's very close to that cutoff, you can always register at your clerk's office and ask for an absentee ballot while you're there. They'll issue you a ballot and you can fill it out and hand it back and cast your vote that way. All right, next question. What stops someone from voting twice? And that's an excellent question, a question that we also had during last week's session on absentee voting. Um, the answer to that is the electronic poll book is a downloaded list from the QVF, which stands for Qualified Voter File, of all the registered voters in a given precinct. And it's loaded into a clerk's laptop prior to each election. And this allows election inspectors to look up if a voter a voter's registration record um, and confirm that they're in the correct polling place and to assign a ballot to that voter. 
And when the um, election inspector is using that laptop, they will be able to see the electronic poll book alerting them if the voter has requested or returned an absent voter ballot. And once a ballot has been issued to a voter, the e-poll book will record that, reflecting the fact and preventing double voting. The e-poll book will also alert the election inspector if a voter appearing to vote in the polls has already cast an absentee ballot. So a couple checks there to prevent double voting. All right, next question. Um, can I give people rides at the rides to the polls? An excellent question. I also saw someone enter in a similar question into the Q&A function. Um, the question there was, is it legal to give someone a ride to a polling place? So at this time, Michigan law does not allow a person to pay another person or company to give voters a ride to the polls. The law is silent on voters providing rides for other voters to the polls. And this, is this issue has not yet been litigated. All right, so those are all, that's it for all of our questions that were submitted prior to today's event. Um, I think we have a little bit of time to go through just a couple more questions that were submitted during our Q&A um, feature through Zoom. Um, and Keila Crane, I don't know if you're available to answer a few of those questions, but I will throw them at you. Sure. Great. All right, first question. When someone registers to vote online, how long is the lag time between submitting their registration and being registered? And does that differ based on municipality? Great question. So it should be instantaneous for you to um, be put onto the voting rolls because you have to utilize your state ID or driver's license number in order to get into the online portal to register to vote online. Great. All right, next question for you. Curbside voting. How is voter ID handled with curbside voting? Also another great question. It is handled the very same as it is inside. So if a resident um, is seeking to vote on curbside voting, um, an election inspector comes out to uh, the resident at the vehicle, they will verify the resident's identity, along with two um, challengers, one from each political party. Once that person's information is verified, then the resident is provided a ballot for uh, to mark. And then that ballot, once they are completed, will be safely and securely uh, placed into a tabulator. So the operation happens the exact same um, on the inside. Uh, excuse me, on the outside for um, residents who need that assistance as it does for uh, residents who are able to come into the polling location. Great. Um, I see a question in the Q&A asking, um, is it true that a person who is at least 16 years old may serve as a poll worker? So if you are 16 years old in Michigan, you are legally allowed to work as a poll worker. However, um, we're gonna refer back to what we've been saying frequently this presentation that Michigan's elections are quite decentralized and that uh, election clerks hire their own poll workers. So some election clerks might have have, um, a preference for certain skills or experience, just like any other job that you're applying for. Um, so if you have a question, if your local clerk or a local clerk will hire 16 and 17 year olds who are not yet registered to vote, I encourage you to contact that local clerk's office to ask that question. And Sarah, if I may, just to expound upon that, you're absolutely sure. right. Um, and just as a general matter that 16 and 17 year olds um, can participate if there are three or more um, registered voters that are election inspectors. So if they are hired, um, they're able to participate so long as there are three or more registered voters there at the polling location and they cannot be elected chair. So they won't be the chief election inspector, but they'll still be able to participate. Great. Next question for you, Keila. Is there a person at each polling location who is trained to use the VAT, and that's the voter assist terminal? Yes, and that's one of the uh, things that our 
um, colleagues at the Bureau of Election has done for in preparation for this election cycle is to provide videos and training, additional training to our clerks as well as our election inspectors on how to utilize uh, the voter assist terminals. So all persons who are working the polls there should know how to, per to utilize a voter assist terminal, terminal and will be able to assist voters um, should they need it. Um, should some issue happen with the voter assist terminal, terminal excuse me, uh, then they will contact the local clerk's office to remedy that issue. But yes, people are being trained and will be prepared uh, to utilize uh, the VAT come August and November. Great. And we have time for one more question. And it's a question I'm seeing a couple times in the Q&A, and that is, Will there be a recording available of today's session? And the answer to that, I'm happy to say, is yes. There will be a recorded um, replay of today's session available that will be distributed to everyone who registered for today's session by email sometime after the conclusion of today's event. Um, and that is it for our Q&A. If we did not get to your question, I sincerely apologize, um, but we will include information on uh, frequently asked questions and election and voting information in Michigan in the follow-up email we send to everyone who's attending today's event. All right, thank you so much to everyone who attended today's session. Um, for voter information, don't forget to go to michigan.gov forward slash vote. Um, and thanks again. Uh, we'll see everyone later. Take care.